Hi, I'm your host, Brittany Gallagher, in a place that provides me a lot of calm and tranquility, doing some forest bathing. Uh, and I'm joined by... And I am also your host, Phil Libin. And I'm also in a place that provides me with calm and tranquility, my home office in front of a green screen. <laughs> no, you're in a forest, forest bathing. <laughs> I, I am, my, my home office happens to be very close to a forest, as, 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 as you know, a really nice forest. So. Yeah, through the Ozarks, yeah. Uh, and welcome to episode seven of Degrees of Freedom, Making the Out-of-Office World, uh, where we dive into the evolving ecosystem that is distributed work. And one thing we've heard a lot about in the last year especially is burnout. So especially during the start of the pandemic, many of us were basically round the clock, work, sleep, work, sleep. We were stuck at home. And actually Lydia touched on this too in the last episode about how this was particularly hard for caregivers and working mothers, but hopefully we can work towards a better situation. So, you know, here you can see there's a lot of news stories around this very topic. Um, and, you know, it was definitely a balancing act for a, a lot of people, but a lot of time has gone by. And one of the things we're hoping to look at this a little bit differently is, um, you know, work-life integration. So kind of balancing between these two things. So Phil, for you, uh, how do you, do, well, you know, what do you define as work-life integration? Look, I think the most important thing to preventing burnout, there's lots of things, but there's one thing that's kind of essential, which is don't work on bullshit. Like another way to think about it is like, if you're going to be burnt out, like at least be working on something that's worth it. That's worth the pain. That's worth the sacrifice. Right, like just the for starters, and I think this like out of office world and distributed work gives you a lot more opportunities to do that because you're no longer constrained by the least bullshit job within commuting distance to where you happen to live. You can work anywhere, anywhere that has distributed work, and 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 you can live anywhere. So like now, there's like almost no excuse to be doing a job that you don't fundamentally believe is the most important job in the world that you could be doing, or at least one of the most important jobs in the world. And I think like burnout and stuff like that, like that's not the magical answer to everything. You could be working on something super meaningful and still feel burned out. Of course you can, but it's a very good start. And I, you know, I would rather be burnt out working on something that's like fundamentally important and meaningful to me than, you know, have a healthy work life balance, be working on bullshit and feel like a fraud my whole life. Uh, so that's kind of that, that. That's kind of the start. That's 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 the start of it. And uh, uh, you know, I think if you're in a place where you get yourself to a place where you think like you're working on something really, really, really important, then an interesting thing happens. At least for me, which is that it's no longer life and work as like two separate things. They do become, as you just said, it integrated. Mm -hmm. And then you know, you don't start to feel that like taking care of yourself is somehow detracting from work because you're like, well. I'm going to be, I want to be more productive because I'm, I want to do more of this thing, which is one of the most important things in the world. And so like, of course I have to take care of myself and be healthy and meditate and not be stressed out. But like it becomes, you're solving the same problem. You're solving the problem of how to, how to be more effective in your life because you're working on something that you think is fundamentally important to your life. You're not solving two separate problems that pull in opposite directions, which is how do you advance your career and how do you advance your life, which is what you're solving for to two separate problems if you're working on something that you don't fundamentally believe in. So that, that's kind of the root of it for me. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense and figuring out how, yeah, like you said, like meditating and how these things actually amplify your ability to do a better job. Um, and those, yeah. those breaks, yeah. Yeah, I, I think if I wasn't working on something that I thought was really important and really important for the world, um, I don't think I, I would feel like I have a good work-life balance regardless of like, how few hours I worked and how relaxed I was and how many, you know, yoga sessions I had in the week. <laughs> okay. So one, find something you're passionate about and work towards that. Two, then focus on the healthy lifestyle and all the things that then make you able to perform better in the job that you love. Yeah, both, right? Like this is the whole like, like, like quality of life improves quality of work and then improving quality of work improves quality of, of life, like virtuous cycle, right? It's like okay. if you're, if you're working on something that's among the most important things to you, then it's like improving that is improving your life and improving your life is improving your impact. And so it just becomes, it becomes this unified thing. And it's just, I don't know, for me, it's much easier to, to like solve a unified problem than distinct problems, especially if those distinct problems pose a conflict of interest. I don't feel that like taking time off is bad for my career, 
because taking time off makes me more relaxed and gives me space. Even when I'm, even when I'm off, even if I'm like on vacation, I'm still thinking about my work because my work is really fascinating to me and really important. Like, of course I'm going to think about it. In fact, like the only time I'm not thinking about it is if I'm too tired to think about it. So like, I don't want to be exhausted from overwork because then I'm not thinking about the really interesting stuff, which is work. So like all, a lot of things just become like much more rational. I think once you've, once you've unified it. And if you ask people, are you working on a job that you think is fundamentally important and meaningful to you? A lot of people will say no. And if you ask, well, why not? Well, you just didn't really have the opportunity to do it. And this new framework, this new, this new reality of distributed work, if you're, if you're fortunate enough to really be able to dive into it, like I think gives you uh, more chances to find that. So if you're, if you, if you're that lucky, I think let's go find it. And there's a lot to cover in this episode. First, we hear from Olaf Fatha of Sequoia Capital on the value of getting asynchronous communication right. And uh, we were talking with Tammy Sun about this concept of uh, of work and then recovery and rest and how you should how you can think about and of those cycles of uh, staying at the top of your game. And Joanna Miller is here to talk about her sabbatical and how that helped her push through some of the more challenging times at work. And we'll also have tips from each of our guests about how they practice work-life integration. So Phil, what's something you do or a boundary you set that helps you, you know, get your work-life integration together outside of, you know, the ability to even have work-life integration? Um, so, I, you know, I, I experiment with different things to figure it out. Right now, um, ever since the, the beginning of the year, uh, I decided I was I was going to take, you know, working out seriously. So I got, I, got a, I got a trainer because it turns out the only way I can actually motivate myself to show up at the gym is if, like, I'm you know, paying someone to force me to do it. Uh, and, uh, and I've decided that like, those are the meetings that I'm just never going to cancel. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think I've canceled them once in, uh, so far. Uh, so I've got, you know, I've got, I've got three sessions a week and I'm like, well, you know what, like before I would have said, well, that's not high priority. If someone really wants to meet with me, like, of course, of course, schedule it over the gym stuff. But now I'm like, no, actually like those three things are the pillars around which I build the rest of my week. Because once once they kind of start to slide, once they start to cancel them, then I do feel like it's kind of infringing on keeping myself, you know, healthy. Uh, again, it's just too easy to like dive into it. Uh, so I've been pretty good. I think um, I've, again, I only canceled one out of out of however many, you know, dozens of of these things that I've had so far, and and it's great. So part of it was just reprioritizing what I would previously consider as like mission critical versus not mission critical, and now I'm saying my three gym sessions a week is are mission critical. So you know, unless there's a literal life and death emergency or close to it, don't don't cancel it. And later in the episode, I'm joined by Lauren Aldridge, who won the United Airlines Your Shot to Fly prize that allowed her to fly anywhere in the world for free. Also first class. So uh, she went all over and we're going to talk about how that plays a part in work life integration. But first, uh, here's Rola. So there's a new problem that I noticed, which is it's easy for me to forget about something for weeks at a time. Because, you know, I used to have like standing meetings with people. And so like once a week I would, you know, talk with a person who's running product marketing and we would talk about product marketing stuff. But now I don't have standing meetings. It's all asynchronous. And so a few weeks go by and I forget to think about the product marketing. And I have to like remember and be, oh man, I haven't looked at, I haven't checked in on that in a while. You know, there's so my first thing. There's this thing called Evernote that helps you remember. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, exactly. And, and 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 my first instinct, right, when I when I had that problem, like, oh, I'm forgetting to focus on things. My first instinct was like, well, let's just go back to the way, like my first instinct was to like, make that the responsibility of my team. Be like, all right, everyone, like everyone needs to send me an update once a week. But then I thought, well, that's actually, that's wrong, right? I don't want you to send me an update when you don't have something meaningful to say, because that's not good for you and it's not good for me. Um, but then I realized, oh yeah, there's this thing called Evernote. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna make a, 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 a checklist, just a checklist of things like that I wanna remind myself to think about. And it'll have like all the things that I just want to remind myself to think about. And then I'm going to make that public in the company. So people are actually going to be able to see what I've told myself to think about. So there'll be an entry that says, oh, next Wednesday, I, I'm going to think about product marketing. And the people running product marketing don't need to do anything with that if they, if they think it's okay for me to just think about it. But if they have something to say about it, that's going to be like a good prompt to be like, oh, maybe I should attach a recorded video uh, with that. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to rethink what are the basics of this so that my calendar isn't actually the most important part because my calendar used to be the most important part of how I lived because that told me everyone who I was meeting with. But now most of my work isn't happening inside of meetings. So I should replace my calendar with 
maybe a publicly visible, uh, or at least an internal to the company visible, you know, checklist. We'll see how it goes. Mm. That's interesting because in many companies, I think visibility into a calendar is a way of getting a snapshot of what somebody is busy with. And if you move to a world that's not as synchronous, then your calendar is probably going to be more empty. You're probably going to be more productive, but I'm not going to know what you work on. And if we're not in the same office, I don't have an ability to bump into you while I'm getting a cup of coffee and say, oh, you know, what's going on? Oh, you're working on this thing. That's interesting. And situational awareness is one of the things I worry about in the distributed environment. And we're still in the very early innings of understanding how, how the work environment's going to evolve over the next decade. So I'm very excited for that. So you, uh, you, you took a sabbatical uh, yeah. a little bit ago, uh, which, is, which is interesting because uh, not, it's not a thing that is, that is very common in, in, in the corporate world. It's a thing that's common in kind of other places. Can you talk about that? Like what, what is a sabbatical and uh, what was that experience like for you? I think of a sabbatical as any um, prolonged uh, absence from work where mm -hmm. you are not obligated to produce anything. Right. Um, and I would even extend the definition to be that you your focus is not on productivity. Because mm -hmm. a lot of us have created uh, measures of productivity, even for our uh, pastimes and passions um, mm -hmm. that I think put us into a mindset around work and goal setting. Um, I was introduced to this concept, obviously, from more academic settings, but one of the things that drew me to Asana originally is that they offered all employees a sabbatical um, after, at that time, three years on the job, mm -hmm. which I thought was very attractive. The only other times I had heard about this were people who, you know, were executives or um, who had been at their company for 10 or 15 years. So um, for me, um, I knew from day one, from signing you know, my contract at Asana that in three or four years time, I would be taking a sabbatical from work. Um, and having that intentional sort of rest work um, balance set up or framework set up for me made me feel more confident in the times and willing, I would say, to push harder um, when we were, when I was leading up to that. Um, the thing that led me to take my sabbatical, um, which was in early 2021, was actually an extreme feeling of burnout because the beauty of distributed work was that, oh, these jobs that I do on the weekend and after hours, I can do them all the time now. So I can do more coaching. Um, I can work on a podcast. I can... I just decided to work, work, work. And by the time we reached the beginning of the year in 2021, um, and there really had not been a material change in how the world was um, opening up, um, it was time to take a pretty significant break. Um, and it was the things that I experienced, the um, shift of mindset that I experienced, um, I think has stayed with me even until the into now. Yeah, and we, we we have a similar uh, we support sabbaticals uh, you know, at our company, and uh, it, it's uh, it, it it's kind of counterintuitive uh, that that it isn't a more common thing, but I think in some sense employers are at least at least in the U.S. are are, are, are kind of scared about the concept of of any kind of absence from from work for the employees, and certainly a prolonged one. But as soon as you get, but all that leads to is people just leaving their job sooner. Yes, uh, you know, which which isn't ideal for anyone. So like, of course, I think you should be saying, well, yeah, you, you can take an extended time, extended period of time off for, for a sabbatical and come back recharged if you, if you decide to come back. It's a similar thing for, for parental leave. You know, we, it's, uh, it's kind of weird when, if companies don't have, you know, good parental leave policies, because um, again, of that fear of like, well, someone's going to be away, but that just causes people to just, to just leave. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I think we've tried to get comfortable with the idea that you know very productive employees or really any employees can 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 disappear obviously in a planned way for months at a time, and that's normal and that's okay. Uh, how do you I mean how do you advise companies to to get comfortable with this because it it does take a different a different shift in thinking. Life is happening for your employees whether you have leave PTO um, or other types of benefit programs, and so I think uh, the what I think about is. Would I like someone's just okay 100% of the time? Or do I want their, their top output in very measured portions of time? And what could rest create for someone's uh, productivity, for their sense of connectedness, their relationships in the workplace, if we were to give them uh, time from thinking about that? Right. Um, 
And I think what leave programs or sabbatical programs create is agency for the employee to say, hey, I have time to focus on the other things that are inevitably happening in my life. Thank you for offering me dedicated time to do that. You know, your employees are so productive. You actually have to worry about them burning out. I mean, that sounds kind of like a joke, but it's not. It's actually really serious. Mm -hmm. So yeah, why do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, I am not the best person to ask this question. Um, I, you know, I, I try my best to live as an example. I rely a lot on my my leaders, particularly, um, you know, my CHRO and others who can help develop programs around this. Um, I'm personally prone to burnout. Uh, I think you will see this as, as a trait in, 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 you know, more than more than two CEOs. Um, but I think like the the way to think about this, and, and interestingly, I've had a bunch of conversations over the last, um, you know, couple of months, like at the end of the year, I try to do skip level stuff. I try to, you know, because of, I'm not interacting with people in the hallways anymore. Yeah. Right? And I try to, you know, chat with people just sort of on the fly and, you know, hearing about how we've had an incredible, incredible year. Um, and we're walking into another incredible year, but, you know, people are tired. Like, how do they, how do they, how do they deal with this? Like, you know, we're, we're going to climb another huge mountain over the next 12 months. Um, and I think like the thing, the thing about, about burnout and performance is that the, the recovery is as important as the spread. Um, you know, when you think about athletics and we're not, we're not like sports, sports ball people, sports ball people. Um, no, we're not. but if you think about like knowledge, working athletic, you know, knowledge, 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 sports, okay. <laughs> being a high functioning knowledge worker, um, you know, the it's, it's like, like chess. Yeah. Like chess. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, like go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, you, it's, it's interesting to sort of try to reposition your, your thinking and your mind to, to think about recovery as a part of performance, not as a break from performance. Um, it is like, it is a part of it. It is part of what powers it. And so you have to, you know, take your rest very, very seriously, both at like a small level daily, you know, like you and I both, we track our sleep. We sort of do, do a lot of that optimization, but you, you have to like pan out also and think about, um, think about performance from, a, you know, cycling between rest and, and recovery and, and sprinting and, and going. I heard a rumor that you, that you, that you got a puppy recently. To, oh, you to heard that? Did, oh, did, I wonder yeah. where you heard it from. You're inside your own head. How's that? <laughs> How's that? How's that? How's that been for? <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What the hell were we thinking? That was Roloff, Tammy, and Joanna talking with Phil about the value of asynchronous communication, how the recovery is maybe more important than the sprint, and how a sabbatical can make all the difference. Up next, we talk to all of our guests about how they practice work-life integration. So do you have any... Uh personal rituals for maintaining healthy work-life integration? One of the things I uh, have implemented into my uh, routine recently is making sure to go outside uh, three times a day. So first thing mm -hmm. when I wake up in the morning, I just throw on whatever I can and I go outside and take in the sun or the fresh air, do some breathing. Um, I try to eat my lunch outside. I live in California, so it's easier to do that around the uh, all year round. Um, and then to mark the end of my workday, whenever that is, I try to walk at least around the block, if not uh, for longer, 30 minutes. Yeah, that's a, that a very good tip. Um, I used to have no personal life, let's be clear. Um, but I <laughs> have been... Same. investing much more heavily in making sure that I delegate better. And so like, really, that is the core of it. Um, delegation. Yeah. I'm not like a, I'm not like a big, you know, um, I'm not a big believer in like the 4am CEO, you know, like ritualized how you start your mornings, how your day is going to go kind of person. I when I get up at 4 a.m. and like take the dog in the backyard <laughs> to poop. So that's how my day's going to go. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> you like the night shift though. I do like the night shift. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not like, I'm not really that, but I do think that you should try not to like, I do, I'm terrible. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not great at this, but like try not to work on your laptop in your bed, for example, try not to um, just try to create some physical space that'll, it'll help you in the long term. I think for me, it's more about thriving in both environments because often the way that's presented, it feels like I'm trading off two things. And I feel like it's a, it's a false dichotomy. Like I'm going to thrive in life and I'm going to thrive in the work that I do. And I love both. And 
they'll sometimes blend together um, and I just don't want them to completely dominate the other. And so, um, and more than that, more than both, like you'll thrive in life because you're thriving at work and vice versa. Like those, they, they should really be mutually reinforcing. Like you should do better at work when you're doing better at life. Agree. There, and so, like, like, and so, no, no, I agree with you. And so making a bit of space for the things that you want to do. And I think this is part of we're not having a packed calendar is one of the important things because self-determination is so important to happiness. That was many of our guests talking about how they personally practice work-life integration. In the final segment, I'm joined by Lauren Aldridge, who won United Airlines' Your Shot to Fly Award, which allowed her to fly anywhere in the world United flies for free, and how that journey has given her more perspective on work-life integration. I'm joined by Lauren Aldridge, who won the United Airlines' Your Shot to Fly. And so right now we're in, we're well, not physically, but virtually in, in Sydney, which is one of the places you went, right? Is it is. Um, I was in Sydney in April. Um, yeah, I went to Sydney. That uh, particular trip was very, very special because so like a lot of people who won have families and such. I do not. I have a partner and a cat who can't travel even in a car. So me and my partner um, got the opportunity to bring three other people on a trip. So out of that, like all of the trips that I went on, I was like, well, I've got to do the most expensive flight that United flies. So I brought my brother, um, my partner's best friend and his girlfriend. And the five of us went to Sydney, Australia on like, uh, and we all got first class. Wow. We all got like access to the Polaris lounge. It was just nuts. So you also went all over the place. I did go also all over the place. Um, so the thing that meant the most, I mean, this prize obviously means the most, but I turned 30 this year. So I had my magical pandemic birthday in Rome, um, my first time in Rome. We were trying to go two years ago, but then obviously mm -hmm. Pan Pan happened. So we flew to Rome. We were there for like seven days. We flew home for 14 hours. And then we went to Buenos Aires. <laughs> so that's this one. <laughs> Me sipping wine and eating lots of meats. Um, that was amazing. Like, so we were, yeah, basically like two weeks. So Rome, home, switch all of our luggage and then go to Buenos Aires. And it was just like magical. So that was November and then December. Um, then in January, we went to Lisbon. That's up there. Um, Lisbon was, it was so beautiful. Um, up next, you're going to, ah, Johannesburg. It's interesting because you've been doing all this travel while still having a job, right? And, um, yes. and you know, this year of your life, like, how do you feel it's been that like your work life integration or like how you feel mm -hmm. like comparatively to other years in your life where you weren't doing this travel right. like do you feel more balanced yeah i mean i've never had a job where they have had like an unlimited vacation policy or even encouraged travel um i've also never worked remote before so i think that this is such a unique time in history for myself and also like for the world to be distributed and to have the ability to like take my laptop like i'm taking my laptop to south africa and we're gonna see what it's like with my whole team basically on the west coast and me somewhere hanging out in africa like well, i don't i don't know what that's gonna look like but it's it's an interesting you know, testament to what we're able to do and the ability to like work where the Wi-Fi is, is like something I always am saying, like, you know, we don't have to be tethered to even our computers, like with the power of this app and like the power of the programs that we use, like using Slack, being able to create videos on our phones, like being able to do all of this stuff remote is really game changing. Um, so I feel incredibly, incredibly blessed. I'm sure I'm going to be sitting my little behind down once I have to start paying for flights again. But, uh, you know, it's, it's really just, it's unreal. And like, I really encourage anybody who 
is thinking about, you know, taking time off, especially here, obviously, or like taking their work to another place, like give it a shot. You know, it's literally like if it has Wi-Fi, you could probably do your job. I mean, my job is very like camera facing and I do a lot of like talking to people with my face. <laughs> um, so, you know, just making sure that you have what you need to to keep it going. But like we have a product that allows you and affords you the ability to work from wherever. So why not put it to the test, you know? This is like such a fascinating story to me because as someone who also like really loves to travel and like mm -hmm. I've made that like an integral part of like that is how I'm able to work so hard mm -hmm. in these intense phases where you're like, go, 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 because I have this like built in travel recovery. Right. And even though my vacations are not relaxing, <laughs> I'm like, must get up by this time and see all these things. <laughs> like yeah. I will come back from vacation, like, ah, like ready to do work. Like it's, yeah. a, it's a really, it's, it's so, it's so like, yeah. I mean, if you have that travel bug, which we definitely do, like that is the best feeling. I feel like getting away, obviously we don't have like a space. Like we don't have a physical office. Like previously when I was literally a man, like an office manager, it was so draining to be there providing every single day. And now to have, you know, be freed from the tethered of like, uh, having to beep into an office and like, you know, do that whole thing. It really just like, I don't know. It's just, it makes vacations. I feel like even more meaningful because they're so in my hands and I don't have to think about it so much. Like I would have to, you know, plan every little thing to make sure that people had their LaCroix, you know, um, <laughs> having to assign little tasks to people like please don't let your coworkers die because i'm not here um <laughs> but now like having a really responsible team and like having a team that trusts me to do what i need to do um it's it's the best feeling so i i love it and i feel so grateful so blessed to be here that was lauren aldridge on her adventures winning the united airlines your shot to fly prize we covered a whole lot this episode and in this series, we'll continue to explore how the redistribution of opportunity is changing the world. Thank you to uh, Tammy and Roloff and Lauren and uh, Lydia uh, and Joanna uh, for joining us on uh, this episode of uh, Degrees of Freedom, Making the Out-of-Office World. And I'm Brittany Gallagher. I'm Phil Libin. Great.